Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, hello. I get the um, infamous post-lunch spot, so y'all are full and probably going to be getting sleepy, but I think my buffalo accent should probably wake you up. You'll be dabbing at your ears as they're bleeding. Um, yeah, so this is my first time speaking here at the RSDSA event, and I'm really impressed with this organization. I have met so many amazing people and support group leaders, and um, I just want to thank again Jim Broach for the invitation. Uh, I'm really surprised to see so many motivated knowledge speakers here and their caregivers. It wasn't easy for you to get here, and um, I'm really in impressed by that. All right. So I will be going over psychological management of CRPS and some of the comorbid conditions that we see with it. And we're gonna start with some phrases that I see come up over and over and over again in my office. And I just wanna know if these sound familiar to you. I can't do what I used to do. I miss the old me, my old self. I don't know if I have the energy to even deal with this anymore. And what if this never gets better? Do those sound familiar? Have you said those at some point or another? Most people have. Again, I hear it every day in my office. We're going to come back to those in a little bit because they all have something in common and play a large role in coping with uh, chronic pain. So. Has anyone here been referred to or sought out a pain psychology visit or therapy? Omega mentioned that she saw somebody. All right, so several people have. But you know, what I notice is that healthcare providers often wait a really long time to send people for that psychological referral. They sort of wait until they encounter a patient that has quite a bit of somatic complaints a little bit more than they might feel comfortable with that clouds the clinical picture, or they wait until they have somebody who's sort of reporting uh, pain in excess of what they think, in their opinion, is appropriate for the pathology. And this, by the way, is my favorite 0 to 10 pain intensity scale, much better than the uh, numerical rating scale that we normally see. <laughs> <laughs> too serious for numbers. Um, and that sort of waiting, it can get really frustrating. And I can tell you, I don't, as the psychologist, I don't want to be seen as the punishment by it, um, having somebody, you know, oh, you got to go to see the psychiatrist or the psychologist because I don't even know what to do. And that doesn't set up a very good environment for our first meeting. So that can be very frustrating from the healthcare provider standpoint. And then from the patient standpoint, when the physician does refer for a mental health referral, it does give the impression, as uh, was talked about earlier today, that, all right, this doctor feels like it's all in my head. And that is so demeaning, so demoralizing, so so frustrating. And so again, when a patient comes to see a psychologist for the very first visit, it's starting off on the wrong foot. So of course, I recommend early on in treatment, I recommend that patients seek it on their own as part of their multidisciplinary treatment. But um, we'll go through some of the things that can be done uh, in, a, in a psychology setting. All right. So I want to put this in context about where the pain psychology fits in with the biology of the body. Now, I will not be giving you a quiz at the end of the talk today. Um, this is a complicated slide. And we did talk earlier about the transmission, the pain signals that kind of ascend through the spinal thalamic tract to the brain. And that's wonderful. And I think the, the take home point to that is pain isn't pain until it reaches the brain. Now that's not to say it's all in your head. So there's a very subtle distinction between that. It's not in the head, but it is in the brain. So I think of this using a cell phone analogy. You guys have your smartphones, right? So if I were to send you a text or a selfie, you would not see those pictures or words flying through the air, right? Right? I hope not. We would have to have a very different discussion on my couch if we did. So we don't. But we use the cell phone processor to make sense of those signals. And that's the same thing with the brain. The brain is making sense of the electrical chemical signals coming up from the peripheral um, parts of the body. 
So that part is wonderful and interesting, but to me, the more exciting part is that there is brain down control of pain. And we can get more control over that part. That's called descending modulation. So descending brain down, modulating that transmission to kind of almost like a dimmer switch for your pain coming from the brain regions. And I find that fascinating. There are many brain regions that are involved with pain. I'm going to show you a, a slide in a moment that shows all the overlap. But when we can harness those emotional parts of the brain for good and not for evil, we get that control over our pain or some control of our pain. Now this is way more, let me make this caveat, than just the power of positive thinking. That sort of phrase sets off even my BS detector, as was mentioned earlier. So it's not all muffins and puppy dogs and rainbows and everything's great, all right? It is hard to do, but it can be really effective. So instead, when we're talking about activating the brain regions to modulate the descending signals, we're really focused more on what the frontal lobes are thinking about in a neutral or pleasant or purposeful way. Omega mentioned that word purpose, a life of purpose, and we really need to find that. I'm gonna give you two patient examples that I always, that I, I stick, it sticks with me in order to hit this point home. So we teach a, a five hour pain class every other Friday to our new patients um, as they enter the clinic. And uh, one of the very first meetings, we had a patient who came in and he said, I have pain 24 seven, except for three hours out of every week. I just have zero pain for three hours out of every week. And we said, well, what do you do during those three hours? And he said, I'm at band practice. I play bass, guitar, in a punk rock band, and no pain. And I said, well, are you cured during those three hours? Of course not. What's happening? And he's focusing those frontal lobes on something that he loves, he has to practice and get involved, and he's with other people. And so the focus is off the pain. So I find that a, a, a nice kind of a simple thing. Now we can't distract 24 seven, but it's nice to have a little bit of relief. My other favorite story comes from a lady we had, she's 81 years old. And she came into the office one day after about 20 years of treatment, and she said, I'd like to reduce my medicines. And we said, well, what's going on? She goes, well, as you know, I'm a widow, and I recently found love again and remarried. I've been a widow for 15 years, I remarried, and my new husband is going to take me on a honeymoon to Hawaii. And we said, oh, that's wonderful. Why do you want to reduce the medicines at this time? We want you to be able to be active on the trip. And she said, well, she leaned in and she said, I don't know what's about to happen in Hawaii, but I want to feel every minute of it. <laughs> God bless her. So it really can come down to modulating pain through what we focus our frontal lobes on. So these are the brain regions that overlap between pain and mood. So again, this is not magic here. This is a very excellent study. Um, well, it's a combination of studies, but a lot of it was by um, Carrion, finding that there are regions that um, talk to each other. And so if we can harness and, and affect our amygdala, which is our fear center, and the anterior cingulate cortex, which is sort of our motivation and, and, and mood center, or depression center, we can really help with that modulation. So in that vein, Treatment, assessment and treatment has taken on a biopsychosocial approach. So we've gone beyond just the tissue or the nerve damage. We have to go beyond that because there's so much more to chronic pain. So we have in the psychological realm, we have beliefs and expectancies. Dr. Lewis mentioned expectancies earlier this morning. And I, I think about this so much about what a patient expects to happen with the treatment plays such a large role. Uh, I had a patient come in and say, well, you know, my doctor told me she got a stellate ganglion block. And the doctor had told her these words. He said, you know, I, I don't think this block is going to help you, but I'll do it anyway. So do you think that block was going to help her? Did it ever have a chance? 
No. So she went into it expecting, based on what that physician had told her, this really wasn't going to be effective. So I think we have to be careful as providers about the power of our words to patients. And patients, really, I'm going to encourage you to be cautious about trying to keep an open mind on most of these procedures. Your mileage is going to vary with all of the stuff we've talked about today. It's going to be different for each patient what works. So just want you to keep an open mind. So coping methods, emotion, distress, personality can play a role in pain. So can culture, social interactions. Um, we know that in a, in a loving relationship, the spouse or the caregiver for a patient can also, they, their brains light up in similar pain regions to what their loved one is going through. They have empathy pain. And that can feed back to how they take care of their, the, the loved one. So there's a, pain does not exist in a vacuum. So we need to look at that whole picture. If we just pick and choose the parts we're going to look for for treatments, it just doesn't work as well. So that being said, I like to frame the psychological evaluation as the chance for us to get to know the person behind the pain. These esteemed medical luminaries have all said the same thing. It's more important to know the person who has the disease than it is to even know what disease the patient has. And that's how we have to come at treating the patient. Um, all right, so I'm going to move on and just talk a little bit about the overlap again between pain and mood in sort of a statistical sense. I'm not going to quote research. I sort of combined it all for you. So one thing to point out, patients with CRPS are not psychologically different than other patients with other types of chronic pain. So there's nothing, as was said earlier today, psychological conditions do not cause this pain. All right, but that being said, Psychiatric disorders and mood reactions are very common in a chronic pain community, CRPS included. So mood can predispose a patient to having more intense symptoms, but most often, at least in our practice, we're seeing it as a reaction to having to deal with the burden of chronic pain. And as was said earlier, Dr. Johnson mentioned this too, that multidisciplinary treatments are recommended coming at this from a, a, a broad approach. All right, I'm going to first go over the, the main three uh, mood conditions that we see come up with chronic pain. And the first is depression, and I'm going to distinguish it from grief. So the rate of major depression increases with greater pain severity. That's duh. You know, the more pain intensity you have, the worse your mood state can be. That makes sense. When pain and depression exist together, it's associated with greater disability than if you have either alone. And when pain and depression co-occur with really strong pain intensity and the functional impairment, we have the risk for um, suicidal thoughts and suicide completion. And I want to just make one mention that please open the door to discussing suicidal thoughts with your loved one. Don't shy away from it. Many people get scared that if they bring it up or ask, healthcare providers too, we get a little nervous to ask, but it's not something you're going to plant in somebody's head that they haven't already considered. So I want you just to be the safe place, open up and have that discussion with people. What they have found in research is that some of these negative mood states can have a greater impact on the pain in patients with CRPS than in those with something like low back pain or neck pain, possibly because it's arousing the nervous system. Your nervous system is already sensitized earlier, as we learned from Dr. Chopra. So it just sort of all sensitized, and those mood states can crank it up even further. So we've got to be careful of the impact of both of those together. So I put some of these questionnaires, you might be asked to do these in a medical office. Um, what we're really looking for is the major symptoms. I'm not going to go over them, you know what they are. We've got the sad or hopeless mood and the loss of pleasure and interest, some of the sleep and appetite changes, and so that's just something to be watching out for. Now, those phrases that we started with, they all have in common to me a sense of loss. They're portraying a sense of loss. And um, 
We talked about that a little bit earlier with uh, when Gracie talked about her grief and acceptance um, discussion. This sense of loss, and this is a cascade of losses, right? We've lost our ability to function and to be spontaneous and to meet our friends next Tuesday at lunch at this time. You don't know how you're gonna feel next Tuesday at this time. We can lose our social support. We can lose a sense of energy and vitality and there's so much change. So what I believe is that at least in most of my patients, it's not a comorbid clinical depression. Rather, it's a normal response. It's a normal grieving response to an abnormal pain situation. So Gracie went over, and I totally agree with you that it's not a stage issue. It is a messy, dynamic, ongoing, never-ending process. Um, and I think it is important to distinguish depression from grief because I think you could treat them differently. I wouldn't want to medicate away grief. I wouldn't want to numb the grief and suppress it because that doesn't allow you to move through all those messy um, stages that you saw up there on the screen. So we need to confront our grief and work through those processes rather than how you might treat a clinical depression trying to rebalance neurotransmitters. So I do think it's an important distinction to make. All right, I'm gonna move on to anxiety. Oh. My main point about anxiety in this part is that there's normal anxiety after pain. I think a lot of people are too quick to pathologize anxiety. It's going to be normal to fear, if I feel this bad now, how am I going to feel 15 years in the future? You know, how am I going to pay that, those bills that keep rolling in, those medical bills? There is normal fear associated with pain. So I feel like that doesn't need to be pathologized necessarily. Now there are some special pain-related anxiety conditions. Now, <laughs> Dr. Chopra sort of poo-pooed the phobia idea, but I do really believe there, has, there is this sense of fear of movement, especially of the affected limb, and we'll talk about that in a moment. So like I said earlier, don't pathologize unless we're truly meeting criteria. And some people will meet criteria for a true clinical anxiety disorder. Abnormal anxiety before pain is an anxiety disorder, and so it is after pain. So the, the major ones we see are up there, PTSD, especially if your pain came from a traumatic experience, um, and the pain can become a traumatic experience itself and it kind of perpetuates that post-traumatic uh, stress. We talked about that kinesiophobia, fear of movement. So what that leads people to do is sort of avoid using the affected limb through immobilization, guarding, bracing, things like that. And I believe there's gonna be an occupational therapy talk later this afternoon, so I'm not gonna go much into that because I'm guessing she'll go into that. But um, Immobilizing that limb can increase the expression of inflammatory markers, can actually make more pain later. And in the brain, it strengthens the fear network. So in and around our fear centers, like the amygdala, there's these weird chemicals that squirt out in the brain matrix, and they hold on to those fear memories and just make it stronger and stronger. So um, treatment needs to be functionally focused through some of those rehabilitative techniques and exposure um, with calming anxiety. I'm not going to go through this. This is just some questionnaires we could give. For patients, try to help your healthcare provider understand where the anxiety is coming from. Was it a pre existing anxiety? Are you now worried about moving the limb or paying the bills? Just help them understand those reasons. Also, try to distinguish are you worrying cognitively? Can you kind of not shut your mind off? You know, it's that nighttime, the lights go off, the worry goes on kind of a thing. And or are you ha holding yourself really tense? Um, those two things might be treated in different ways. And then anger, very, very common. Omega mentioned her anger through this whole process. And there's reasons that have to do with the disability, that frustration from not being able to reach your goal, uh, poor sleep. If you're not sleeping well, you don't have much energy left over to be Mr. or Mrs. Nice Guy in the morning. So that sort of frustration and irritability is very common. 
Research shows, too, that it's not just about the anger presence, but how we express it. So it can be just as damaging to hold it in and hold on and not tell anyone what you're feeling. That can really increase the physiological arousal in the body. But also, if you're just spewing it out everywhere, you can understand that's not going to make for good interpersonal relationships. So instead, we want to be able to try to reach a balance with assertive communication, saying, here's how I feel when you do this. Here's how we can kind of reach a solution going forward. So we kind of do some assertiveness training and therapy. And Earlier, Dr. Lewis mentioned cognitive distortions, um, distorted ways of thinking, illogical ways of thought. And one of those deserves special mention uh, in the pain world, and that's called pain catastrophizing. Now, you may have, yes, and I will self-disclose, I tend to be a catastrophizer. I can blow up a thought like nobody's business and, and worry about it a lot. And the pain uh, part of this is if you've ever said or heard your loved one say, this pain is killing me. It's an, a, a very magnified sense of the danger of pain. Rumination, just thinking about it, I can't get it off my focus. And feeling helpless to do something about it. There's nothing I can do to stop this pain. That trifecta of thoughts kind of hangs together to create pain catastrophizing. And the research shows that when that is present, it is one of the most strong indicators of function, uh, poor function, depression, um, inhibited spousal responses, it can amplify those brain areas in a way you don't want it to. And it can create inflammatory responses, believe it or not. Our thoughts can create more inflammation. That's wild. So it's a very strong predictor of negative outcomes. The treatment is <laughs> brilliantly named Decatastrophizing. I don't, psychologists love their stupid words. So, decatastrophizing. What is the worst that could happen in this situation? What's the probability that that worst case scenario is actually going to happen? And if the worst happened, could I cope with it? So, really trying to explore some of those challenges uh, to the catastrophizing. And acceptance is something we work a lot on in our chronic pain psychology. I'm not going to go over it too much because uh, Gracie did a really good job, but it's that you'll have to learn how to live with it, and that's a hard thing to hear. So as she mentioned, it does not mean giving up. It does not mean giving in. And the way I see it is it's about the willingness to experience the pain and in continue to engage in your valued activities. Your pain will be there whether you're in the recliner or whether you're at an event, right? Learning about this stuff. So you might as well do the thing that brings you meaning. Now, when I was training at Florida, my advisor told us about this analogy, and I really like this, we, we teach this to our patients, about a boxer versus a dancer. So if I were to come up to you and say, I am your chronic pain, what would you want to do to me? <laughs> Don't ask that. That is usually prompts a very violent and aggressive response, right? Especially in the beginning. And so that takes a lot of energy to constantly fight against the pain. So instead, we encourage our patients to consider, this is, this is hard, but consider the pain as a dance partner. Not one that you invited to dance with you, but it's there. And you go through life with it, and sometimes it's going to lead, and sometimes you'll be able to take the lead. But there it is with you. A lot less energy than fighting it, and it kind of shows the willingness to have that in your life. I like the acceptance framework a lot better than the traditional coping framework. I'm going to tell you a little bit about why. Coping strategies can be adaptive or dysfunctional. Uh, smoking three packs a day, drinking alcohol, doing all this, that is coping, but it doesn't mean it's healthy coping. So I worry a little bit about that and the coping strategy. It's a constant effort to push that pain down. The word cope actually means in Latin and Greek to strike a blow, to fight it. And so we don't want you draining your precious energy that you have so little of anyway. And 
sometimes some of those efforts at quieting the pain and emotion to cope actually can make it worse if we're resting too much. All right, so to do this in a therapy context, we think about this equation. Pain equals suffering over intensity. And if you remember math, I'm, I don't really remember a lot of it, that in this equation, the integer of pain is really dominated by the suffering component. It doesn't matter in a way how strong the intensity number is. If that suffering component's high, the pain is really going to be present in your mind. But if the suffering component's low, that can reduce the pain. And we think about this too, like volume on a radio, right? Intensity is the, like the volume of the song. And the suffering is if you like the song or not. So if you're a Nashville country music fan, you don't mind if the volume is high. But if you hate country music, it can be as low on the volume scale as possible. You're still not going to like it. So we really want to work with both of the components, not just reducing intensity, but also the emotional reaction. We do this through various ways in therapy, acceptance and commitment therapy, um, finding that life of purpose, and I put on here some of the books for mindfulness meditation. I'm going to a course in Atlanta in two weeks on um, teaching mindfulness in a different way, and I'm very excited. So it's just about being present, being able to sit with your symptoms without judgment or labeling. And those are some good books. John Kabat-Zinn, um, master of this. So what else would you do if you actually did decide to come see a pain psychologist for your pain? Well, it would depend on the setting, OK? So and I, like I said earlier, I think earlier better is better. You might be referred to see someone before a surgery. Uh, certain uh, insurance companies require you to see a psychologist before implantation of a spinal cord stimulator or something like that. You might be referred for crisis intervention, but I think it's appropriate any time. You might do individual therapy. We do group education. There's a lot of ways this can be accessed. These are all the different fun things that I get to do on a daily basis. Again, we have to have so many tools in our toolbox because different things work for different people. So a lot of it is trial and error to kind of figure out what a patient is going to respond to. Uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, has anyone heard of that? We're changing our thoughts, we're changing our actions and behaviors in response to mood to be able to enhance our mood and indirectly then our pain as well. So the picture goes beyond just how an event can affect mood. We have our reactions to our mood. So if we're anxious and we go down a two liter of Mountain Dew and we start pacing the halls, that's going to maybe make that anxiety worse, right? But if we go talk to someone and we do some breathing, that can calm it down. So it's about our choice of behaviors we do in response to our mood. And then the kicker as well is it's the thought that counts. It's our interpretation of the event or situation we're in that can really drive our mood. So we work a lot with pain beliefs. Um, I think one of these that's important on here, I don't have time to go through all of them, but associated with positive outcomes on the right-hand column, four down, is how active you want to be in the treatment process. It's called locus of control, sort of a control belief. Do you believe you have a role in managing your own pain? Do you believe the doctor is solely responsible? Do you believe it's just up to chance? Do you believe it's in the hands of a higher power? And depending on where you believe that control is coming from, that can really determine your outcomes. I like this diagram. I cannot remember probably where I stole this. I think I enhanced it from something. But when I think about quality of life, which of course is our goal, physical quality of life is not the only game in town. There's other things that feed into our overall quality of life, like our social health and our mood. And I, I like to call it intellectual and creative health. Are we using our brains? Are we using our God-given talents? How's our spirituality? And what happens is people sometimes, early on in the process, let the pain, which is one part, of one part of quality of life, overshadow all of those other things. And when we t what we would like to do is turn it on its head so that if we work hard to improve our social health and our emotional health 
and reuse our brain again in our creative processes, it will overshadow the physical. So I sort of like looking at that to be able to turn it on, turn it on its head. So some of the behavioral targets, the B in CBT, would be to decrease some of the overt behaviors we see. The guarding, the bracing, the wincing, that kind of, the grimacing in pain. That type of behavior definitely communicates something to our loved one. We are in pain, I need, I need you to know this. That communicates to our physicians, but it doesn't help the pain and it can actually make it worse. So we'll work with patients on how to just body scan, understand how they're responding, and communicating about their pain. Improving relationships. My main advice on this, and this goes for both the patient and the caregivers, family members, physician, set your partner up for success. Don't make that loved one guess what you need. Don't make them mind read. Right? Don't make unreasonable demands. And for the caregivers, do the same thing. Let your partner know what you need. Continue to live your life as well. And don't focus solely on the pain. Ask your loved one, what did you learn today? What would you like to do this weekend? Rather than how are you feeling today? So a lot of times it really goes, we've got to coach the whole unit, the whole system, as Dr. Lewis mentioned earlier. We encourage activity pacing. You know what this is. Taking a break before you need a break. So a lot of times we get in a cycle of overdoing it on the good days, having increased pain and fatigue, and then we rest too much. So we have this really roller coaster day to day. And instead, the goal is to do a little break, do a little break. That might be how you got here today. I know on our, our drive up from Birmingham, three hours or so, I have my husband pull over about every 45 minutes because that's about what I can tolerate. It makes the trip longer, but it helps a lot when you get to your destination. So you want to build in those planned rest breaks. Goal setting and balance. I think each day, if all of us, regardless of pain, can think about doing something productive, something for self-care, and something that's just pure fun. And the only thing that pain dictates is what you do in each one of those. So for example, in one of our classes we were talking about this and a patient said, I said, well what could you do on a good pain day, a good day, for that's uh, fun? And she said, I would go out to see a movie. And I said, how about on a more difficult day when you have to stay closer to home? And she said, well, I would rent a movie. <laughs> and we said, all right, you really like your movies. But that's the whole thing. You can still do that fun aspect. It just uh, determines if it's going to be more sedentary or not. We promote the relaxation response. These are all the amazing uh, relaxation techniques we can do. Some people hate these. Some people love them. I really enjoy, for CRPS patients, doing bio, the heart rate variability biofeedback. So what we do in that is we hook a patient's earlobe up to a monitor, and we're just reading your heart rate, and we're training you through various breathing and other exercises to get control of your autonomic nervous system and be able to kind of balance those areas. You can do this paced breathing technique that we use at home. There's a free app called My Calm Beat, and I love it. It's very simple, it's a set of lungs, and the bar goes up in the lungs, and the bar goes down. And you pace your breathing in a very symmetrical way, and it locks into that fight or flight system and dials it down. It's a really nice technique. There's plenty of apps for this, but that's one of my favorites, and it's free. We treat comorbidities. So many other medical conditions and health issues start to crop up when we have chronic pain. So we work on promoting the anti-inflammatory diet. That was discussed earlier. Taking supplements, making sure we're choosing healthy foods. Uh, stopping smoking does not have a great effect on nerve pain. So, and all the little mini blood vessels that are trying to help us heal. So we have to work really hard on smoking cessation. Again, easier said than done. Sleep hygiene is a big one. Getting our behaviors around the bedtime process all scrubbed up. There's a bi-directional relationship, so the more pain you have, the harder it is to fall asleep and stay asleep, right? And the worse sleep you get, the more pain you actually have the next day. So it's a really important uh, condition to treat. We do this through stimulus control and sleep restriction. So 
no bed during the daytime. If you need to rest, we encourage you to go to the, your couch or the recliner, but not the same bed you're going to try to get sleep in at night. And of course, avoiding stimulants like caffeine. Does anyone know the half-life of caffeine, the amount of time it takes for half of the stimulant effect to get out of the body? The average half-life? Seven hours! So we always say cut out your caffeine approximately seven hours before your bedtime. That helps to reduce some of the stimulant effect. That's a long time. And then our uh, blue lights in our screens, our phones, our tablets, or the television screens. So some people like to kind of distract before bed. So we ask people to either get a pair of those blue blocker sunglass shades. Have you seen those? Those big yellow kind of glasses. Have them by your nightstand. Watch TV with those in the evening and it cuts down on the blue light. Or use a free app like Twilight on your phone that changes the color of the screen so you can go to bed a little bit nicer, a little easier. All right, those were some of the B targets, the behavioral targets. The cognitive targets tend to fall toward negative thoughts. And these are a very strong predictor of outcomes. So some of these examples are some of our most common negative thoughts. Uh, all or nothing thinking, right? I have to be able to do my hobby just exactly as I did before or I can't do it at all. Right, that's all or nothing thinking. One that I see a lot is the shoulds and musts, the imperative thinking. I should be able to wash my laundry like I always did. Or we apply it to others. He should know how I'm feeling and be able to anticipate what I need. We tend to should all over ourselves all the time. So watch your thoughts, monitor your self-talk, make sure you're not shoulding on yourself. And the, the trick to that is to change the wording from I should, that rigid pressure, to something like I'd like to or it would be nice if. It would be nice if I could mow the lawn in an hour like I used to, but that's not going to happen. So it takes some of the pressure off um, of you. Cognitive restructuring techniques, these are ways we can challenge those negative thoughts when they're getting us down. Maybe uh, looking at the advantages and disadvantages of hanging on to our anger. What is it really benefiting you and how is it harming you? And sort of doing a pros and cons can sometimes help with that. What would I tell a friend in this situation? Sometimes we don't take our own advice very well. But we're very good at offering our advice to a friend that we care about. And so if we just took the advice we would give a loved one, we would probably uh, do better for ourselves and be kinder to ourselves. Some other of the more advanced techniques, we examine core beliefs, uh, like feeling pain is a punishment. Uh, these are things that are central to who we are and they can be very difficult to work through. We talked a little bit about word substitution. Probably every one of you today used the I can't to I could if. At some point, I bet a thought crossed your mind, I can't sit there all day for this conference. I'm sure that crossed your mind, I thought it. And what you probably did was, well, I could if I brought my scooter and my pillow and my caregiver and took some breaks and brought a snack. You figured it out. And so that's, that's a really helpful uh, technique. Positive self-talk. The silver lining of pain. Um, Omega actually mentioned this without saying silver lining. She learned who was very important in her life, appreciated her husband more than she even did before, um, kind of learned what was important to her to be able to help other people. So those are some nice advanced techniques there. So how did this stuff work? It's not magic. It's not voodoo. It works with that top-down processing. So we're changing, we're releasing our endogenous opioids. There are three pathways, I didn't mention this earlier, three chemical pathways that do that top-down modulation. Endogenous opioids, we make our own painkillers, serotonin, and norepinephrine. And there are other chemicals in there that help those things talk to each other. But we can rebalance our own neurotransmitters by the way we think and focus and find that life of purpose. I like to think of choosing techniques for patients based on kind of the brain structure. As was discussed earlier, the brain is plastic. 
Neuroplasticity is a thing, and we can harness that and change the pathways for good. And so we like to kind of choose if a person's really having a lot of suffering and mood changes, we know we're looking at the anterior cingulate, and we would choose some techniques based on that. So again, this is not magic. It's not woohoo, like, you know, too fancy, but it, it really uh, it makes sense with the way the brain is structured. So we encourage everyone to create a pain management self-management toolkit. I stole this from the Mayo Clinic. They have a wonderful pain program and I went up there for some training and they will have each of their patients create a literal tool box. And you might fill it with things you can use if you have a, you probably are not using temperature modalities. In our clinic with low back pain, we have people put in their TENS unit and their heating pad and their ice packs and their acupressure. That might not apply for CRPS, but whatever you can do to fill your toolbox, your essential oils. Um, some people put in a Bible or a book that they like to read. Some people put in pictures of their children or their pets. And that's something you can do when that pain spikes up. You can reach into that toolkit and feel like you have something that's in your control, It'll, even if it's just for the moment. So I would encourage each and every one of you to have, a, I have a drawer in my house that has all those things in it. So when the pain spikes up, we go to the drawer. I don't have to think through it. I did include, and I'm not sure, I know this will be on the video, and it'll be, um, I don't know if we'll have this accessible in any other way. You can email me for the slides, but I put in a bunch of helpful texts that I think can take this type of mood training further. So the Relaxation and Stress Reduction Workbook, the John Kabat-Zinn book, um, Mind Over Mood really helps take you through the cognitive behavioral therapy steps. There's cognitive therapy specific for chronic pain. So I find these books really, really helpful. And I'm going to leave you with a poem. Sounds a little artsy. But we end each and every one of our pain classes with this poem. And I like it. It's, a, it's for motivation. So this is It Couldn't Be Done by Edgar Albert Guest. He was deemed the people's poet during the Depression. And I, he just kind of created some accessible poetry. And I hope this applies. Somebody said that it couldn't be done. But he, with a chuckle, replied that maybe he couldn't, or maybe it couldn't, but he would be one who wouldn't say so till he tried. So he buckled right in with the trace of a grin on his face. If he worried, he hit it. He started to sing as he tackled the thing that couldn't be done, and he did it. Somebody scoffed, oh, you'll never do that. At least no one ever has done it. But he took off his coat and he took off his hat and the first thing we knew, he'd begun it. With a lift of his chin and a bit of a grin, without any doubting or quit it, he started to sing as he tackled the thing that couldn't be done and he did it. There are thousands to tell you it cannot be done. There are thousands to prophesy failure. There are thousands to point out to you one by one the dangers that wait to assail you. But just buckle in with a bit of a grin. Just take off your coat and go to it. Just start to sing as you tackle the thing that cannot be done, and you'll do it. All right, thank you very much.